<laughs> oh boy. I don't know about you. But for me, <laughs> it's summer. We just had our first uh, 80 degree weather finally. Man, it seems like it took so long and yet it's early for the season. I mean, normally it's not supposed to be 80s yet, but yesterday we had our first 80 and last night we threw open windows, and threw open doors, and let that new apartment we live in, our house, so to speak, just blow in all the air that it could, you know, and see how hot it's going to get or how cold. We've got air conditioning, but still. But again, my wife couldn't sleep at all. She's not used to having that kind of heat. <laughs> so it was interesting. We had our first 80 degree day and then at night it was it was warm. Boy, I tell you, I'm ready for summer. So I don't know what it's like in your part of the country, but where I'm at, man, bring it on. <laughs> I could use some Sacramento 100 degree days again, you know, it's like, where's it been? But uh, you know, I praise the Lord. I, I like summer. You know, it just seems to give me a kick. You know, I enjoy the sunshine. You know, I, I've recognized that at different times in my life, you know, I prefer to live in sunshine than in shade. And aren't you like that? Don't you kind of like to live in the light rather than the dark? Don't you like to kind of be in the bright light as opposed to being in the kind of like shadowy areas, you know, the questionable parts of your life? I know for myself, I do, you know, maybe you were different. <laughs> maybe you like living on the edge and kind of falling over once in a while. Me? Uh-uh. <laughs> no, thank you. You can have it. I kind of like living in the light, you know, because after all, we are children of the light and children of the day. You know, I look around at my, my tomato plants, you know, the one over here, you know, and I just thank God for it because yesterday, you know, I had, uh, you know, been talking to you about these containers that I made, you know, out of uh, trash bags and milk cartons. And unfortunately, I overwatered this poor little cherry tree tomato plant, whatever thingy. And uh, I didn't realize that I really overwatered it until I came over, you know, and I started to spray. I got a little sprayer and sprayed some water in it. And all of a sudden, all the dirt was floating. And I went, oh, I think I overdid it. So I put my finger in it. And sure enough, it was like... Lake tomato. <laughs> so I had to kind of adapt and had to puncture, puncture some holes in the bottom of my trash bag, you know, so it could leak out the water. I kind of waited a day and it didn't really recover, but overnight it's recovered. You know, the water's leaked out and now all the leaves are beginning to come back. And my little cherry tomatoes are about this big around. They're starting to get bigger. So it just needed, you know, to get rid of all that extra water, you know. I'm always nervous about not enough water because of where we live. But praise the Lord, you know, I mean, that's what God does, is that he causes us, even when we've gone through circumstances, to recover, to after the spring has fallen, you know, and we've gone through the winter and, and we've endured the fall, we come back to spring and towards summer and we begin to be restored. God begins to bring us back to life. We begin to blossom. We begin to bear fruit. We begin to spread out our leaves, so to speak, and to grow. You know, sometimes God prunes us so that we can bear even more fruit. So don't be surprised if that happens in your life. But, you know, I just am thrilled to have what I have in the simple ways that I have them in the humble way that God has used me and the blessings that I've enjoyed and just been amazed at seeing how they grow and how they develop. You know, we uh, have taken the time to do some things in the ministry that have just been phenomenal. It'll it'll show itself slowly, you know, as I begin to post them on the web. But in the ministry, like with the web pages and with the bloggers and the stuff like that. God is like open doors that will just keep me busy for the rest of my life. <laughs> you know, I'm always reaching. You know, it's like, give me more. I want more. Help, help. You know, reach this, reach that. Do this, do that. And now I just went, okay. <laughs> it's like, 
ain't no way I'm ever going to get that done. <laughs> so, praise the Lord. God's got me set. <laughs> this is it. We're there. We know we're going it. You know, so it's kind of like I'm amazed at all these other you know, men of God that I grew up with, you know, because they were always pretty much set where they were at. Once in a while, you know, some of them got bounced around a little bit, but for the most part, they were set, you know, and they, they grew in their little pots, you know, or their big pots or whatever kind of pot they were in. You know, and I don't mean smoking it. <laughs> but they grew and developed and became big plantings of the Lord, you know. And now God gave me this new vision. Not really new, it's kind of the old vision, but just kind of unveiled the rest of it. And I went, wow, cool. Technology finally got to where I wanted it to be, and now it's like, wide open horizons, you know, and it's like, cool, <laughs> great. You know, being a part of the entire body of Christ and sharing the word of God and, you know, talking about Jesus and inspiring people to discover that they can have a personal relationship, not only of knowing him by faith, but hearing him by his voice, that he would come and sit down and have coffee with you in the morning, that he would literally come and eat with you at night, that he would spend his day with you, that he would talk to you, that he would walk with you. I mean, that to me is more exciting than anything else about doing things, you know, in the ministry. Though those are fun, don't get me wrong, I kind of like that, you know, it's kind of fun to get productive. But to hear someone tell me about <clears throat> how they've been changed by what God has done in their life, or how God has become more real, slowly but surely, He's become a little more evident in their life. They begin to kind of look at things a little differently. They begin to listen a little carefully and all of a sudden they begin to start talking as though God is talking to them. And then suddenly one day they just go, man, you know, I was talking to the Lord the other day. And you, look, you listen to what they say and you go, talking to the Lord? You were talking to the Lord? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, the Lord started talking to me you know, the other day. You know, I heard him, you know. Really? You heard him? I remember when you didn't do it. And you can't tell them that because, you know, they, they, they figure they always heard from the Lord. So, you know, but I get a kick out of it. <clears throat> There shall cleave not of the cursed thing to thy hand. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has his hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous for good works. You know, I think about that, and I look at it, and it just says, like, teaching us that denying ungodliness. I mean, really, think about it. We really should be putting aside, you know, the stupid things. I mean, you know what they are. Come on. You don't have to, me to tell you what stupid things are. You know, getting into, you know, arguments and debates and getting into politics and getting into fighting and aggravation. Sure, you can go vote, but you don't have to lie about it. You don't have to be deceitful about it. You should be godly about it. Think about that. What if you were a, a godly campaign in, for the presidency or a godly person in the midst of someone's campaign, doing godly things for them, doing godliness in the midst of it? What a difference it would be. You wouldn't backbite, you wouldn't knock them, you wouldn't tell bad stories about them, you wouldn't lie about them, you wouldn't make up you know, all these inaccuracies, you wouldn't make slamming cartoons about them, you wouldn't do all these stupid things that they do against the president or against the the party that's running against them or against anyone because you'd be wanting to care for them. So you see, nowadays they keep talking about bullying as though, you know, bullying were, you know, like only a thing for big people picking on little people or that, you know, children fighting amongst themselves. Bullying goes on in politics. Bullying goes on in the world. Bullying goes on at work. Bullying goes on everywhere that we allow it to happen. That's why God says to put away these things. Quit bullying people. Quit bullying pulpits. You know, there's the bully pulpit. Quit bullying politics. There's the bully politics. Quit bullying in, you know, anything that you do. You know, choose rather to be subservient and God will bless you. You see, that's the difference. Let them 
do their thing. Walk away. Don't be a part of it. Don't get involved in it. Walk away. Let God reveal what He can do for you if you'll let Him do it. See, too many people are caught up into this idea of they have to assert themselves. No, you have to assert or let's, let's put it this way. Instead of asserting, you have to insert. You have to insert God in the equation and God will take care of any assertions that need to happen. In other words, when God is inserted in the equation, then suddenly everything else makes sense. You don't have to do a thing. You are not meant to be the defense of God. You are not meant to run out there and you know suddenly raise up a banner and say, oh, we got to stand up for God. God can stand up just fine for himself. You just have to pray. You have to pray and have faith and confidence that God can do what he promised he would do. He will redeem. He will purify. He will cleanse. He will be our defense. He will be our rock. He will be our strong tower. He will be our salvation. He will be our justifier. He will justify us. He will sanctify us. He will place us in a protective cocoon, so to speak, so that we would grow up into becoming the butterflies we're meant to be. God will do all these things if we turn it over to Him and let Him do it, not we do it. We always have to keep watching that in this world, it's not meant to be for us to stand up and make something out of this world. The world isn't our home. We're heading for home. This is just teaching us how to live with God in a pure way, in a godly way, in a way that lets Him be God and you be His servant. All you need to do is keep praying and turning it back over to God. Live the life of Jesus. Jesus did not assert himself. He did not say, by my authority, I say unto you. No, he just said, I say unto you. Because he said, I see the things which my Father says and does, and I do only those things that please him. My Father worketh, so I worketh. You know, I mean, that's the whole point, is that Jesus did those things that he saw that his Father was doing, and his Father said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I will please. We should be the same way. If we're thrown into prison, endure it. If we're thrown into jail, endure it. If we're thrown into, raised up as, you know, mighty men of God, supposedly, you know, endure it. You know, because you're liable to fall anyways. So the point being is that endure all these things as a good and faithful servant, bringing godliness into the situation with mercy and grace, so that you don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather you trust the Lord to bring you to the place of entrusting Him with everything you have with all that you do, in all your ways, acknowledging Him and letting Him direct your path, then godliness is accomplished through you because that's what godliness is. Godliness is simply letting God do it His way and not your way. Besides, can't you admit, your way sucks. <laughs>